Hello, uh, for this video we're looking at the topic of software, the 18th topic, so we're nearly there. Uh, so we're mainly focusing on the operating system in this video, so you know that's the most important bit of software around. Um, so we're looking at also functions and um, a bit about applications and also models too. Let's begin by looking at what software is. So software is really just a program running on a computer system. The hardware uh, is the physical components that make up the system, whereas uh, the software is the programs running on the hardware. So um, if we look at this kind of diagram, we can uh, first label uh, what we call applications or application and operating system as software. So uh, they're both uh, uh, software, but um, when we say applications or application software, uh, we mean programs that perform a task for the benefit of the user. I've sometimes seen it described as kind of um, programs that replicate something humans do in real life, but to try and help, like a word processor, uh, which is an example of an application, uh, you obviously can write things uh, on paper, but a word processor helps and maybe adds other features too. So one thing I just want to point out, um, if you get asked anything about application software, make sure you don't use brand names. So don't say Microsoft Word or Photoshop when you're talking about uh, image editors. Make sure you use, call them as what their uh, non-branded name would be, um, just because it, the chances are you won't get marks of that if you uh, had to write it down that's just a point i wanted to make so applications uh you know apps apps are obviously short for applications games um aren't fundamental they aren't system software which is the next one uh, same web browsers too so system software is a category um contrasting with application software that performs tasks needed to actually operate the hardware and uh, also just sort of provide services for other software so the operating system is the main example often uh, so, uh, other things like game engines and utility programs would also be examples of system software because they're they're not helping us necessarily although utility program arguably is but really they're providing services for other software um, so operating systems and game engines for better example uh, utility programs are sometimes uh, called system software um, so the main topic of this video is the operating system also written as OS and it's basically essential software that links hardware and other software together so it bridges the gap between the user and any applications and the hardware and so examples of mainstream uh, operating systems so ones we use you know in ha household use so Android uh, Linux and Windows you know, also iOS for Apple devices um, so if we look at um, what actually an operating system does uh, the first thing is kind of going back on a topic or part of the topic we looked at in a few a few videos ago that was about virtual machines so if an operating system hides complexities of the hardware from the user so it acts as a so-called virtual machine um, and so um, fortunately we don't have to deal with the issues um, between the hardware and the software, the operating system bridges this gap, and also it hides the other, hides the due complexity for other software too. The software doesn't have to worry about interacting with the hardware because it goes through the operating system. So um, it also does lots of things we have to look at and now lots of different functions like managing the hardware resources, any input and output devices, network users, access to memory, and so on. So we have to look at that now. First one being file management, and so um, we know that computers store data in the form of files which have this set structure everything in the computer has to have a set structure to some extent and they're physically stored in, on disks we looked at this technology a few videos ago and they're presented to views in different ways depending on the operating system used so roughly it's the same and actually uh, historically each operating system might have its own kind of uh, file system but now it's slightly more flexible um, and so the operating system maintains records of all the files stored in secondary storage like for location and also things like file permissions so which users are to access what and also um, they often allow files to be grouped into folders so this is Windows 7 quite obviously uh, for organization and so they have this file um, folder uh, hierarchy um, and it is very uh, beneficial for us organisation wise and also uh, offering systems prevent uh, present a user interface to us a graphic user interface um, which is obviously very useful um, next uh, point it wants us to talk about uh, these are all listed on the exam board specification so we have to cover them unfortunately so um, uh, the function it has in terms of input and output is the operating system controls how these devices are used by the program so it has to go through the operating system first um, and so uh, the what we call a device driver um, 
it basically is just something that tells your operating system how to communicate with the device. So when you plug something into a computer, it has to install the driver and it allows um, this communication. So for an example, when we want to print something, um, we have to the operating system has to organize this and so it will go into a print queue um, and then it will just be sent to this uh, output device I guess you'd call it. Um, okay next point and that's about resource allocation and so um, uh, for a program to run you need to have certain resources allocated to it so like memory, the processor is a resource, um, secondary storage is a resource and so on and so the OS needs to ensure that enough memory is allocated to each open program, that's a first point and this is needed so it can run efficiently or run at all, it needs uh, some memory to be allocated or it maybe needs to provide additional data so allow access to the hard disks when a program or um, something needs more, da more data um, and this kind of links into process management as the example, um, as the example would call it and so uh, when we say a process we mean um, a process is a computer program being executed so a process is something being executed in that instance and so we want uh, many programs to be open and lots of things lots of processes are happening whenever you use a computer and seemingly they're being processed simultaneously so it, when we have loads of programs open it seems like the, the, the computer is processing them all at the same time so when you're um, uh, you know, writing an essay and listening to music at the same time, it seems like it's happening at the same time. But actually, when you only have one processor, so a single microprocessor, um, only one program can be executed at one time, even though you have many programs loaded into the main memory at a time. And so for um, it to appear that processes are running simultaneously, uh, the operating system has to allocate access to resources like the processor, like peripher peripherals. Uh, peripheral is just a device used to either put information into a computer or get information out, um, like storage is an example of peripheral, like a, a monitor is too, and it needs to allow access to these resources only when they're needed. And so it basically is, does some sort of clever um, scheduling here. And so because the process is so much faster than the other components, you know, billions of instructions can be carried out a second, billions of cycles. Um, it means that the operating system can constantly switch between processes and so if it's um, executing something to do with one program it can switch while it's dealing with something with the peripherals because peripherals are going to be much 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 slower than a processor and so it can switch to it can switch back to other processes while kind of the slower components are de dealing with that bit of the processing so the idea is that an uh, operating system is constantly switching between uh, what's being processed um, and also the operating system will give higher priorities to some processes it can also interrupt processing if something kind of urgent needs to be processed and it means that higher priority processes are given more processing time by the operating system. Uh, the next one to look at is network management and uh, for this one um, uh, I, I always, I'm always uncomfortable when I don't really understand what the exam board want us to cover because it's fine if there's something on the specification I don't know and I can go and look it up but when you don't know what the exam board want from uh, people sitting the exams it's difficult to know how you can teach it so uh, the network management, what I'm taking this to be is either um, the idea that networks of computers need specialised network operating systems like uh, just a single computer needs an operating system and so these uh, might exist in routers or switches, hardware I don't think we've looked at yet or we're going to look at in future videos. And these operating systems allow resources to be shared like a, a singular operating system does. It might also mean that an operating system on an individual computer um, has visibility to manage users on a network, like protect uh, certain data to uh, goes back to kind of file permissions. You don't want another computer on the network accessing files on you know, the computer the operating system is on and it also needs to facilitate access to shared external resources like printers that may be on the network. So you can kind of look at it in terms of you know, the exam board want you to know about network operating systems which is more unlikely or just the fact that operating systems have this network capability and historically you might not have an operating system that allowed this network um, connections um, but now they have this built in basically. Um, the next one is to look at is memory management. This is like more straightforward. 
Um, uh, so when the user requests a program to be executed, so when you open a program, uh, it needs to be loaded into the main memory, so the RAM. And the sub-programs in the OS or just the programs um, that to do with memory management, first check how much space is available. You know, if not enough space is available, something called virtual memory might be used. Not something you need to know, but basically this means um, memory is created on the hard disk as if it's in RAM. This is obviously a lot slower, but it allows the RAM capacity to be increased. And, and then it will, uh, if there is space, it will allocate allocation for this program to be moved into from um, the secondary storage. Uh, there is a lot more to talk about in memory management, but the next kind of step about covering this point is m so much harder that it won't be on your course. Uh, the final one to look at is user management. Um, like um, on a normal household computer, the operating system will maintain a list of usernames and passwords and allow different profiles to be created. You know, you might have a family computer that has different profiles. Um, and also for a computer system like a mainframe, where you need access from multiple users at the same time to the same resources and data. Uh, the operating system needs to ensure file corruption doesn't occur um, because if you are if two people are trying to change the same file at the same time, you know corruption would be very easy to uh, take place and the operating system has to prevent this. Um, so these points it might be worth going back and pausing and reading them um, because it it's a lot of information and it's difficult. I, I found this difficult. This is probably the hardest thing on the course so far for me to cover because it's not obvious what the exam board want you to know. And um, a lot of these points I haven't heard of before or they're, the names are different to what I'm used to. So I've tried to cover this as best I can. It's not easy. The chances are you won't need to know that much information about this, but um, you never know. So um, the final thing to cover is the concept of software models. So a model is. Um, a software model is a computer program designed to sim simulate aspects of the real world. So, um, you can simulate the weather. So this is um, something you will see on like weather forecasts. Um, the economy. So this is just some data, some graph to do with the economy. And things like nuclear physics. So this is, I believe, a picture of a nuclear reactor. And it, it, you'd much rather simulate it on a computer than do tests in real life to do with a nuclear reactor. And so if we want to build a software model, you first need to actually work out what connects the elements of a real life problem. So you need to work out what variables um, are in place and what effects, you know, what knock-on effects occur. And also need to make assumptions and simplifications because it's not feasible to model a situation perfectly unless it's an extremely simple uh, situation in the first place. Most real life processes are so complicated like an economy is so complicated that you couldn't model it perfectly. Often processing a computer, it goes to the extent where you don't have enough time in the universe to process something. Some problems are so complex that you cannot process them, not in our lifetimes at the very least. So it needs to be relatively sim simple. You want it to be as accurate as possible. As I say, you need calculations to be able to run in a reasonable amount of time. And you've got to be careful that you don't make it too simple that results are wrong or misleading. Uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, this is kind of me preempting any exam questions by the way. And so if we want to create, um, if why would you want to create software models? Well, it saves time and money. You know, you can repeatedly test things. You can just tweak things on your model. You can work out what happens when you change, you know, something in an economy. You can work out what happens if you change something in a nuclear reactor. But that wouldn't be very feas feasible to do in real life because you don't know the consequences. And part of the software model is to work out what will happen in the future. And often, uh, you model things that aren't safe in real life, so like wars can be simulated, and nuclear reactors, obviously, and it, and things like skyscrapers. You can't, you don't want to predict what happens. You don't want to test what happens when you, you know, uh, an earthquake hits a skyscraper or a tornado. Um, but you want to do it in a computer model because it's much safer. Uh, so uh, that's it for this topic. A very awkward one to cover because it's um, difficult to tell what. Is actually going to be examined. You're going to be examined on. Uh, so uh, I do hope it was useful. Next time we're looking at a slightly more straightforward topic of programming languages.